Good afternoon and welcome to Lifestyle Marketing. My name is Kim Butts, Executive Coach, Trainer, and International Leadership Facilitator and host to the Lifetime Series where we add value to people's lives happening every day at 12 on uh, epizradio.com. Uh, joining us again, marketing and communication expert, Craig Page Lee. Craig, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, I'm enjoying the, the cooler weather and uh, not necessarily the, the lashing winds, but it's definitely great to have some cooler weather and rain. We always need a good bit of rain in our jersey. <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, it, it is a bit. Uh, I mean, I, again, I'm wearing a, 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 a jersey today, and um, Saturday we were in the pool. <laughs> so I, know. I know. It's quite incredible. From 36 degrees at the end of last week, 32 <laughs> on Saturday, to you know, I've got a jacket on myself today. Yeah, it's uh, my brain's coming. Going, what's going on? What, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Craig, so glad that um, we could uh, uh, have another chat today. Um, last week, just to recap, uh, well, actually, you know, you could just recap what we were chatting about, but we, we spoke about the WhatsApp uh, debacle and um, uh, the privacy issues, um, and, and you've really clarified up um, some information. So, guys, if you want to hear all about that, check out online. Um, all that information is there. But... Um, did you come across any significant finding statements that are worth noting and uh, noting um, since our last conversation? Yeah, Kevin, thanks. Um, it's obviously a hot topic because the, the comms in, in the online media is flowing that, that I'm noticing on a regular basis. Um, so, so I'll just open the session today validating the statement um, that, that WhatsApp has officially delayed the introduction of its new rules, uh, new, new security policy by three months so that they can determine the exact implications on users' data and also just to give them a chance to present a more compelling and understandable uh, release to, to the public so that they don't see this, this, this migration, which has been rather radical, and I'll, I'll get back onto that uh, in, in, in a short while. But I think there, there, there's really an important thing that we need to understand here. WhatsApp has always positioned itself as adhering to a golden standard of security. And, and here they say that, you know, the new policy doesn't affect the contents of your chats, obviously doesn't, which remain protected end to end. Um, so the gold security of standard means that no one can view the contents of your messages, even WhatsApp, Facebook, or the authorities. Now that's a powerful statement. The, the key thing here is that it's actually your personal contact details that have been shared for ongoing communications. But just to put people's minds at ease, the content within the conversation cannot be shared. And that's that's an important thing for people to know. That said, though, um, there, there was a significant switch from, from WhatsApp to Signal in that first two-week period of, of 2021. We're seeing that, you know, in, in the first week uh, from around the 4th of January or so, there are about 246,000 uh, downloads and, and switching from, from WhatsApp to, to Signal. A week later, Kevin, 8.8 .8 million downloads of, of the Signal app. You know, so, so that, that is definitely quite alarming. And, and again, there's a perfect segue into, into something that, that my, son, my, my son shared with me on, on the weekend. He, he didn't know that I had covered this in my in my first podcast because the link wouldn't work for him. So he just phoned me and said, Dad, what the hell is going on here? All my friends are downloading Signal and I refuse to communicate with them on, on the Signal platform. Um, so it's it's ever apparent in South Africa. A lot of kids are still doing it. Youngsters, school going through to university, he's just, uh, you know, he's, he's out of varsity now. But, but his friends who are educated are still not taking the time to understand what the ramifications of this is. So it's it's vitally important that WhatsApp actually, and interestingly, this is a comment he made, he said, Dad, so then why are WhatsApp not actually putting the right information out, educating us, and not not letting us second guess? So, you know, lesson lesson for, for WhatsApp there. Yeah, I mean, just on that, that point, Greg, I think um, I was sharing some social media stats with, with a group of trainers uh, training today, and, uh, some of the stats that I came about, um, and this might have shifted in a big way, but uh, WhatsApp has about 1.5 billion users. So for them to have made a statement like that and kind of done it that badly, 
Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> you would have thought that was, you know, the, the way they put this information out would have been strategically considered uh, and thought about and had a proper PR campaign around it. Correct. Correct. Around so many users, you know, and it's strange that they they kind of just did this um, quite flaky and, and not really being very clear on exactly what they're doing. Yeah, and, and it does surprise me that an organization of, of the caliber of brands that exist in that organization actually have missed out on, on the key thing. They provide communication platforms for the world and they yeah. haven't utilized the platforms effectively, even if they were pushing it through Facebook, because how many of the users actually have, have, have shared accounts? You know, so using one platform to inform another, create an online portal for questions, and it's, it's weird, yeah, it, it, totally. But, but it doesn't surprise me because um, I was reading a really interesting online article today on The Observer, a uh, title within the Garden Media Group UK, and uh, it was quite a powerful statement that that really gets one thinking, well, I suppose, you know, what they don't really care. And, and I don't really want to see WhatsApp and, and, and Facebook and, and, and the brands and that. Type. But let me read this to you. It makes a really interesting statement. It says, the social network isn't known for keeping its promises. When Facebook bought WhatsApp in 2014, it pledged to keep the two services separate. Yet, only a few years later, Facebook announced aims to integrate the messaging system of Facebook, systems I should say, of Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. This appears to have stalled due to a technical and regulatory difficulties around encryption, but it's still the long-term plan. My comments on that though is, well, businesses do change strategy and structure quite often sometimes, which requires streamlining, consolidation, sharing of core services, eliminating duplication of costs, and looking at revenue, new revenue generating streams. In reality, why should Facebook be excluded from adopting this policy? Why should it not be allowed to evolve its business and, and morph into a more effective, structured, rigid, revenue generating business model? And in doing so, it would need to integrate these things to meet its strategy. So tough, beating on the one end, but but on the other end, it's almost inevitable because it's a business that needs to grow and move into the future. And I know we, we picked up on that uh, um, quite a bit last week. I, I, and I just, you know, it cements that sort of thought process around one of the things we also mentioned is having healthy competition is really a good thing. So as much as they, uh, uh, they handled it maybe not as well as they could have. Um, it definitely opened the doors to to push that button of like, well, who else is available and who else could we use? Um, you know, the next best thing would be what's the alternative to Facebook and um, uh, and how do you have a good big migration to a different platform uh, just to really give and solidify a good a good amount of competition because you know then consideration around pricing and advertising and all of that is going to fluctuate tremendously based on um, people migrating to something that's cheaper better but as effective um, so you know it opens up so many so many opportunities even though it's been a bit of a shock to to a lot of people and and, and again the interesting thing here is off off the cuff you know can you think of any collective of brands that could come together and offer the same value chain as Facebook group does. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't, apart from Google, when we were chatting last week, you know, if, if you look at the, the Google as, as, as a base platform, the, the, the video interaction we having, the back-end payment gateways and things like that, maybe there is something there, but the, the reality of what Facebook has in place, for somebody to come and emulate that, the, 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 the cost barrier itself, I'm sure would be prohibitive and and good on them for understanding the the innovative need to to move forward and find value in the likes of the messengers and and uh, whatsapp so you know that that aside um let's let's wait and see if if there is a competitor that that funds route to market now you mentioned uh you mentioned apple uh and um uh, you mentioned that they're tirelessly working to ensure privacy and security, and you know that's it's top of mind. And I think people, uh, <laughs> I was thinking when I read this, and I was like, uh, I had a I had an incident where I was 
um, there was a long week. It was like an April holiday or something. And I have a, a Google speaker, one of those that you actually speak to. And uh, my Google speaker kind of stands right next to my TV. And I was, uh, I'm a YouTube fanatic. I spend a lot of time on YouTube. I learn a lot from it and I watch a lot of information there. Um, and on this holiday time period, I kind of watched a whole bunch of weird stuff. So I was like, yeah, so what about aliens? And what about the FBI? And what about uh, like dictatorship? And what about presidencies? And you know, all the stuff. What was interesting was as I was watching this, my Google speaker, liked, uh, the sort of light that indicates, you know, it's being listened, it's, it's listening into conversation went on a number of times through this sort of, series of, of YouTube videos that because it was for a few days that I was just binging out. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, that whole thing about like, what do people, what is Google actually listening to? <laughs> and then, you know, it immediately kind of goes, okay, well, your phone is there, although the screen doesn't go on, yes. uh, how often do, are you being listened to? You know, yeah. so uh, in the back of my head, I'm kind of going, yeah, it's part of the world that we choose to live in today. You know, there's so much that we get from these devices and so much that we share with these devices, uh, we don't instinctively just kind of go, um, oh, uh, maybe they're actually listening to us and maybe we need to be a bit more uh, cognizant. But I mean, you, you found something interesting about Apple, uh, which I thought was like, oh, I didn't know this. I, I'd love to oh, hear that. <laughs> that's exactly it, I didn't. Quick, quick question for you though. So, so you're obviously aware that your Google speaker has a light that emits when when it's recording. So, so in a way, you one step into the know already based on what I'm going to share because I didn't know this. I I did an update uh, um, of my iOS this last Friday, and and it was when I was reading again. I, I like to go and read about what the features of the updates and things like that are. So on the weekend, I dived into into another online platform and I was trying to read a bit more and 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 it was only when I read this article believe it or not from Forbes yeah. okay it was a 2020 September 2020 article and and it was only this weekend that I realized this and basically what it it did is it it tells you that in the new operating system of 14 which we're now on 14.3 in South Africa there are two little lights that appear on your phone and, and I actually noticed this and, and I thought it was just possibly like on a website, sometimes you get the two little dots and you know that there's a swipe and you get a carousel of images or something. And when you go on your Facebook, at least on your iPhone screen, you get the dots at the bottom and you swipe and you get all your, your next page of, of app, app icons. And I thought, okay, this is a swipe functionality, but actually it's not. The, the orange light is actually there to signal when your phone is being used either orange for the camera i mean the microphone or green for the camera and i went what the hell so this little light has appeared i was not aware of it and it means that my audio is being recorded by the phone then i saw the little green light and it went oh my goodness there is camera activity in the back end as well. So I did a bit of a deep dive into this. And then, you know, it wasn't as alarming as, as it potentially could have been, but it was enough for me to go and reevaluate all my security settings on, on my device. So the phone needs a microphone to operate in phone mode. It needs a microphone and a camera to operate in the mode that we're conducting in now. Yes, we're on our laptops at the moment, but you know, doing it on our device, we'd need the same thing. So there are certain apps, particularly the, the online meeting apps that require both functionality. So you know, those things are inevitable and you will see those lights coming on. But there are other apps like your Gmail account, sometimes Facebook, your, your, some of the, the base content apps, they do not need access to your microphone or your camera. And it's those apps that are actually being unscrupulous. Yeah. And what they're doing is they've got algorithms and, and little threads that pick up word sets and, and when, when it picks up on that, it activates those particular functionalities. And what I did then is I, I followed up to see if there really were any steps online. I knew how to disable it, but I, I, I wanted to follow up to see if people who weren't in the know could actually go through the journey. And yes, there, there's some very clear steps on how to go into your security settings and disable it. And I spent about half an hour just 
working through my entire device, through every single setting, every single app. And I, I've actually switched Siri off on every single device I own. My two mobile devices, my laptop, Siri's off. It's, it's inactive from a camera point of view of every single app that doesn't need it. And it's just, again, being aware of the fact that there are things happening in the background. And if you don't make the effort to be informed and manage the security parameters and activity around your behavior, you're going to be caught out and you're going to be bombarded with advertising. We're in the comms world. That's what we do for a living. But believe me, I can't stand it. So <laughs> I close it out as much as, as much as possible. So, um, you know, very quickly we'll get to understand where to and where not to uh, uh, use these particular things. But just be, be acutely aware constantly. So uh, one of the things that's just occurring to me now is, uh, isn't it a case of going, okay, you know, I'm not an FBI agent so uh, or a spy of any sort. So, like, I really don't have anything to worry about. So. The worst that can happen is uh, I'm going to I'm going to see a whole bunch of information more regularly around conversations I'm having uh, about stuff I'm interested in. Is that really a bad thing? Um, like, yeah. is it really placing this responsibility at, at, at a completely personalized level? That's that's a damn good question. Thing, if you're in the market for wanting product. It's an irritation when an interstitial takes over your whole screen or you have to wait six seconds or three seconds to get into a piece of content that you're really looking for. And for me, that's it. I, I know when I'm in search mode to purchase, when I'm in search mode to inquire, okay? And, and that's my reality. I make a decision to go into that mode and I go and find the information I require. I'm not in that mode when I step out of that mode. So therefore, I don't need the interruption of the next mode I'm in. And that's just my personal choices. When, when I'm wanting to sit and read online or watch a YouTube video online relative to the industry and I spend an inordinate amount of time researching, reading and, and, and trying to be up to date on, on, on activities in the industry, I don't want a Javiana's ad to pop up because I'd been looking at beach holidays previously and things like that. I'm not in that mode at that point. So for my personal decision is I close all of those out. But I know when I switch into the mode, it's like when you're awake or you're asleep, you're in either one of the two modes. I'm in a mode where I want to inquire. I'm in a mode where I don't want to inquire. So really, it's it's just about personal preference. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I don't have anything to hide. But I just don't want to be bombarded by it the whole time. Yeah, and I, as you're saying this, I think the other thing that I find, because I look at YouTube, because I spend a lot of time on YouTube, is the the algorithms picking up on stuff you have clicked on and picking up on stuff that you you tend to watch. Um, what I also find is that they, they generally repeat content. Yes. Uh, and also, you know, you don't have the option or functionality of going, oh, well, what else is there to watch besides the stuff that I'm watching? Um, you know, so it, it almost limits you to a degree. So, I mean, absolutely, I find that, I, I really find that annoying. Yeah, and, and, and there's this, this morphing of the bias of what you're watching as well, because I will go and do a deep dive into publications that are purely around business and thinking and very little in lifestyle. But then when we're talking about a lifestyle or a thing, I've got to go into the lifestyle proposition and suddenly there's an association that I'm interested in in a purchase in that space or that, you know, I'm, I'm interested in pets and not the hell. You know, I, I, I might have investigated pet insurance because it's a key part of insurance conversation, but it doesn't mean that I want to buy pet insurance. Yeah. So it's, it's really about me just wanting to filter out those uh, annoyances actually at the end of the day. Nothing more than that. So, t so talking about you know these different um, uh, platforms and and the security features and how algorithms are affecting us. Last year, last week you mentioned uh, the twenty twenty visibility report, um, and and something about the analyzing the pictures and tell us more about that because I think um, you know for brands and uh, for um, brands of brand awareness out there, you know a lot of people may not even know this. Um, uh, that, you know, computers and AI are literally scrutinizing sure, even yeah. 
which is what we're sharing. Yeah, yeah, that's again a great point you make. So, yeah, Kevin, I was quite excited to come across uh, um, this particular report in Brandwatch. I, I follow Brandwatch and probably got about 10 or 12 really cool reports on them. And, and you know, just to start off, I'll, I'll just sort of reposition Brandwatch for the listeners. Um, so Brandwatch is a business that's often referred to as, as, as the number one consumer intelligence platform, and it produces a number of insights and reports on all things digital and all things social. And it's it's in particular reference to the social aspect of Twitter that, that this report uh, is referenced. So, so the Brand Visibility Report 2020 They've been producing these reports since 2017, um, and each year what's been really cool, again, Brandwatch is a business that has also changed and morphed in its own right, so it's partnered with technology platforms and they've bought them in and and have fallen under the, the Brandwatch banner, and in doing so, the last three, four years, they've evolved the, the analytical capability and they've changed some of the measures that they apply. So they caution in this particular report not to do a direct comparison between the previous reports, which I've steered away from, but but I do, however, want to reference the, the top 10 in 2019 and the top 10 in 2020 of, yeah. of what we're actually going to be looking at. And, and basically, the, the context for the listeners here is that they scrub Twitter to view photography and images posted to find the brands that are most prevalent in those posts. Okay, so, so it's an, just, just explain what does scrub mean? So just people... So, so, people. so, 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 so scrub, yeah. So, so basically what they do is they've got image insight technology and, and these filters, they can run all of the mentions and in 2019 they ran 50 million tweet mentions through these filters and in 2020 they ran 40 million tweet mentions through these filters both uh, over a, a, a six week period and basically what what happens here is they set the parameters in the filter so they're not looking for words so they all run the script and find in the 40 million or the 50 million just posts that have got images attached to them okay a lot of tweets are just pure pure text based your 140 characters and which obviously is, has increased in, in more recent years to 240. The image attached posts are filtered to one side and then they can run further scripts to actually do a scan on are there any brands that they're able to pick up in those particular images. Yeah. So they can categorize by the brand so you can feed in please find images with Nike and the swoosh, whether it's Nike, the word, the logo, or, or the, the collective. And they've got 800 plus, library of 800 plus brands from around the world, and they can build the algorithm relative to the brand's association and run those scripts through there. So these 40 million images, 50 million images, can then pull through on a ranking based on how many of those images had a Nike logo? How many had a Adidas logo? And all the other brands that sat in their library, and they profile those relative to ranking based on mentions or frequency of posts of images with those particular uh, um, um, brands or logos in place. So yeah. prior, prior to 27, 2018, there was no text analysis. What they have done in the last two years, but but in 2020 in particular, so so going from the ranking just on a on a on a logo representation, they also started looking at influencer re referencing. So influencers were identified by searching for the most common names to appear in text relative to those particular brands that were ranked high. So if Nike was was at the top and you know, they would then run another another script on that to say, based on Nike, all the posts of the Nike images, how many actually had the word Nike used in the text? And then they were then able to aggregate the names on the frequency of using Nike in text, and then they could see who were actually potential influencers and, and uh, um, informers of the brand. Really, really interesting piece. So not only just from, from the brand, but also other objects, scenes, 
sports scenes, stadia, action analysis, so they could actually get into a really nice granular analysis of those particular images. Um, but what, what's really interesting here, their technology imitates the way that the human eye processes visual content, particularly when you're in, in, in the physical retail environment. And the neural networks detect logos, detect key information when you're out and about. So their technology has been developed to, to detect that as well. So it is able to detect actual content objects and, for instance, food types, which we'll, we'll actually pick up on in in, in further detail later on. But they also then look at a gender differentiation. So then they look at, they, they, they run a script with, they've got access to some of the biggest name databases in the world, and those are separated as male and female names, and then they run it on that. And then there's often a big pot of names that are not familiar with either gender and names that sort of cross over into some genders as well. So what they do is they exclude those, and they only use the absolutely obvious, easy to reference names that, that, that come through there. So, so using those parameters in their methodology, yeah. some really interesting findings, particularly in respect of, of, of the 2020 report. So I want to just quickly quote an opening statement on the report. It says, yes, so the power of image has been well documented for decades, but with the democratization of photography, especially because of the widespread use and uptake of smartphones with cameras, Communication is now more visual than ever. It's a lovely factual statement. Yeah. Um, but what, what's really key for me, another piece that stood out, is that for brands, the images consumers share provide a window into how their products or advertisements are seen in the world, yeah. how they were used, and the context they appear in. Now, that's really important. For marketers to get to understand how their brands are being represented and being able to learn from that. And there's four key insights that, that really jump out at us from, from this study. Um, but what's interesting here, though, in, in the closing piece of that before I go into, into the rankings, is that only 14.47% of the 50 million images filtered in 2020 had a reference to the brand in the text. 85% of images posted is predominantly around lifestyle action and things that you're doing or have affiliation to. You haven't necessarily posted because it's a Nike brand, you're making a distinct conversation or post around that. It's about, it's me and my context of life. I've posted and I've got a Nike logo or Adidas or whatever it may be. So only 14%. 14.7% around uh, um, intentional posting relative to that brand in question. Yeah. So that's a hell of a lot of, of, of posts where brands are actually, they should actually start paying consumers for representing their brand in the open public space, to tell the honest truth. Yeah, because, I mean, that's, uh, uh, does it mean that, you know, as someone who's on video often or takes a lot of photos or shares a lot of content, does it help me to put a Nike shoe here in the background? <laughs> so I, I'm part of the algorithm. I mean, is there a point to that? So, so the the reality here is the influencers. I, I think that they probably there is an opportunity for brands to work with the likes of Brand Watch to go and sit and have a look at the filtering and go, okay, bring me those names that aggregates to the top as potential influencers and yeah. go and engage with them and strike a deal for them to become a formal influencer in that particular space. So the opportunities do exist. If you're wearing a different Nike outfit every single week, well, believe me, you could potentially become an influencer in the local market around the right attire for a Nike outfit relative to the nature of what we're discussing today in a business context. Yeah. yeah, if you're wearing a T-shirt, it might not be right. But if you're a you know a fitness instructor and giving nutritional advice and things like that, you're probably on the money, and you'd have a lot more salience of the brand and opportunity to be drawn into the brand conversation as a potential influencer. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. So, so just looking at the top twenty, uh, uh, top ten, twenty twenty, top ten, twenty nineteen as well. So Nike, I default to Nike just because it's a really great brand, but actually it is the number one brand by a long way in, in the ranking, Adidas number two. And then the, the, the number three one is a really interesting one, parental advisory. 
as a brand, came out third on the ranking. <laughs> Parental advisory. Parental advisory logo. Oh, wow. On the brand came out third in the ranking. Now, you probably wonder why the hell that is. Yeah. Interestingly, it's associated with album covers, and I'll get into to three key areas of, of entertainment, business, and, and, and brand. The parental advisory logo appears on album covers in the entertainment section as one of the top seen brands in entertainment affiliated to music. Very interesting. So there's a lot of people buying a lot of music with some nasty words in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then it goes on to, to uh, Los Angeles Lakers, Spotify. Spotify has, has, has come out a lot. Emirates, the, the airline. Uh, Apple Inc., Amazon, Coca-Cola, and uh, Manchester United, which didn't surprise me that it was in, in, in the top 10. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 20, 2019, interestingly, um, Amazon was at the top. McDonald's was, was in place. Chanel Lifestyle was, was number three. Adidas in there, four. EA Sport. I actually really would have thought that EA Sport would have been much higher in the 2020 ranking, considering the fact that there's been such a proliferation of online gaming in the last year due to COVID keeping everybody in, indoors. So that was quite interesting that it wasn't in the top 10 in, in 2020. Nike in the top 10, but below Adidas in this instance. Apple still in there, um, a position lower than, than it was last year. Pepsi, Chevrolet, and and again the airline Emirates. So an interesting interesting mix there. But with with that with that in place, Kevin, the the three sort of key key learnings here is that sport was the industry with the most representation of the list. Yeah. And of twelve brands in the top sport ranking, six of them were football teams. And, or soccer teams, not American football, soccer teams. And uh, hence the reference to Man United in, in the 2020 thing. So quite interesting considering again that sports teams haven't been able to play live events for the majority of 2020. Yeah. Um, and it goes to show that even when sports aren't in play, the sponsored jerseys and vests are really the visibility that the brands are paying for. Well, I'm, like, I'm a little bit like taken by by, by surprise here yeah. because i kind of going like uh, <laughs> this is really like analysis to like the next level right it's yes. like really getting into to people's uh, psyche and understanding what are people paying attention to what are they prone to share what are they uh, share freely available and 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 kind of you know what is making up part of their lives um, because you know it's uh, instinctively you're taking a photo, you sh you're tweeting it, or you you know having something. You're not from that perspective, kind of going, oh, I wonder what I'm wearing, and um, unless you're actually being paid to do it, right? But uh, you know what's really the question that's really in my head now is kind of going, how do you use this information, and how do you uh, how do brands, for example, how do marketers apply learnings from such um, uh, from this type of information? So, so I want to quickly jump into two other categories, and then that'll that'll start expanding on your question because that that's such an important question. So, okay. so you talk about fashion. <laughs> you yeah. don't decide what you're going to wear. Well, well, fashion retail is is the next most uh, photographed in the sector, and and I actually thought that entertainment would be, but interestingly, when you look at fashion retail, it's about the fashion brands themselves plus the collective of a lot of posts around the sports players brand so collectively it actually jumps up above above um entertainment and in in, in the entertainment space uh, gaming and music stand out and then as as i mentioned the the uh, parental control being the the key driver there in in the um album covers and then nintendo and and xbox really flying flying the flag high so yeah, what what are the what are the things to learn there? Um, straight off the bat, brands of association for me is really where opportunities exist. When when marketers get to understand, well, let's take a step back. When marketers get to understand through gaining access to to these kinds of behaviors, is 
what mind state are their consumers in or consumers in general in and what are the aspects of association in that mind state and how do brands then build a conversation and a proposition to meet you in that particular mind state or physical state and bring the brand preferences to play and and i think an important piece there is one of the examples cited was they did a deep dive study on pizza yeah. and and you know there were four key insights that that came out of out of pizza and there it was pizza's a lockdown home favorite <laughs> we crave different kinds of pizzas on different days yeah the most shared pizza images actually have some common qualities and they are clear favorites when it comes to here it is an accompanying beverage with pizza so <laughs> looking at the trends um you know and 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 seeing the pizza play in further detail is there are certain days that this particular type of pizza is purchased there are other days where pepperoni only is purchased there are also days where order in is more prevalent than sit sit out and and obviously the sit out has has reduced substantially through through the lockdown but a really interesting piece that came out of this again as well, and you talk about the lifestyle proposition, is that there was a sudden surge in searching on pizza ovens during the lockdown period. So there are many consumers who are sitting at home going, okay, we can't go to restaurants, we really do like our pizza, we're sick and tired of the takeout, let us actually get an oven and start creating our own pizzas as well. Then the recipe opportunities came on the back of that. So the key brands that were doing the delivery of the pizza saw opportunity to extend their value in doing recipe composites with the brand associated so that you can do your own build at home to delight you in that particular way. And then the opportunity existed. Is it Coca-Cola? Is it Sprite? Is it one of the other brands that actually is what goes with the particular meal? <laughs> so, so basically, in summary, Craig, what you're saying is I should wear, every time I do the show, I should take a picture of it. I should wear a Manchester jersey. I should put a bottle of Chanel right here. I should have a big curse word on the back of the wall. Um, and I should be eating some pizza. <laughs> but the pizza box lid must be open so they can see which brand it is that, that, that you're consuming. You know? so, so again, yes, the, the reality there is when marketers have the appetite excuse the pun here on pizza um but the appetite and budget to work with the likes of brand watches to yeah. actually scrub that information further to start looking at the human-centric behavior and see how their brands can fit in there i think there's a there's a really good opportunity but but for me what what's what's great but also at items and whole sectors and most importantly for, for marketers to determine the brands of association and possibly do some really good co-joined marketing activities and advertising, particularly in a, in a climate where budgets are under such strain. Really work with your partners, because in this instance, brands of association become a partnership, is, is you know, invest in the money, work together, find some core proposition, and put some value bundles out there. I think that would be really something great that South African brand marketers should should actually start looking at. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as you're talking, I'm kind of going, uh, you know, what is the brand association to to the lunchtime series, and uh, how do we how do you leverage that more specifically, and what is the content you're sharing? How are you sharing the content? Because um, it really gets you to start thinking from a marketing perspective: is what is it that we are how we how are we sharing content in a way that is um calculated and uh and i know calculated might sound like the wrong word but may, maybe more thought of you know that that it's not just a it's a it's a it's a nice picture uh but you're really considering in brand association how you're delivering it how you could work with brands how you could actually leverage off each other etc 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 but there, there, there there's an interesting sort of counter to that and again this is just thinking off the cuff as we're chatting um you know we know that the power of brands is shifted to the hands of the consumer okay the consumer really is in control can make a break make or break a brand by a single tweet okay yeah. so so where's the point where 
consumers actually gain back the control of the images that they post. Yes, they're posting into the public domain, and all the terms and conditions clearly state that you know the the brand has the opportunity to glean some insights out of that. But but where where is there an aggregator that says that for every one of those images with the Nike Swish or the Adidas three bands, okay, those particular uh, um, folk users of the platform that tweeted those images and those images that we used to give an insight to another brand should be paid a few cents for every time the images were being used to create a marketable value proposition for another brand or for that brand. And in fact, if it is for that brand and it's been targeted at you in a more augmented, personalized way, well, actually, you've given the triggers to the brand. Is there any compensation from brands to be able to keep you in the loop? You've posted something, you're showing affinity with the brand, the brand uses that to bring something back at you, but actually the brands use the particular information that you shared. So you paid for the shoes, you paid for the jacket, you paid for the t-shirt at the outset. So you've committed to the brand from, from a spend point of view. Now the brand is actually leveraging your spend to get more spend from you. And you go, actually, as consumers, why don't we get something back out of this proposition? Yeah, I'm like, if we're supporting the brand, we should be paid something in return. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and does that change loyalty into a different spectrum of the way we perceive loyalty to be? Is it, guys, everybody who has posted with a Nike shirt, where we're going to use that information to contact you if you opt in, okay, to say, here's a, here's a value driver for you, but because you've already committed to the brand, here's something really special for you. Yeah. And where, where are brands in taking it to that level and really understanding that the power of, of the brand is in the hands of the consumer and the, and, and the consumers have committed to your brand from wallet, but also from sharing and recommending. So there has to, there has to be some give back some way from brands. But I think within, with, with saying that, you, it's also bring an, an awareness around uh, the expectation that uh, the consumer is really having back at the, at the brand, kind of going, um, no, we're actually paying attention to the fact that uh, you're leveraging uh, all of this information, all of this uh, visibility that we're as consumer giving you. Um, we should, we should essentially be compensated for for that. You know, yeah. so it's also putting a bit of pressure back on the brands to kind of go for us to keep them. How do we how do we support them and and keep them uh, in our pocket rather than someone else's? Yeah, yeah, you know, 30, 30 40 million uh, scrubs at 85% seeing you know, a Nike logo, that's a hell of a lot of money that they'll need to invest to give back. But at the same time, you know, they're, 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 there's a medium somewhere relative to power in the hands of consumers, to brand loyalty, to brands actually committing to give value back to, to those consumers. It's amazing. Um, Craig, so in terms of uh, 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 wrapping up today's conversation, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the things we should be considering, some of the tips that we could be using, uh, considering our, uh, our, um, our actual security around social media, but also um, you know, leveraging uh, our insights around leveraging our brand better and considering how to do that more effectively? So, so from a security point of view, take the same rigor of application that we spoke about last week relative to cleaning your online presence and just setting the parameters around the brands that you really want to engage with okay like i mentioned earlier there's certain brands that i want affinity with and there's others that i don't because they they were there at a particular moment as research and that that's it so so do the same thing go through your mobile device clear out all of the apps that don't need access to listening to you and feeding you nonsense Okay, and yeah. and just be diligent in that process, and and every single time you do a software update, revisit the process because what happens is many of the software updates supersede the controls that you put in place previously, and I've noticed that particularly around series association to all of the apps. So whenever I do an update and I go through all of the apps, series reactivated in most of those apps. So that is a listening threat okay because yeah. you're going to be bombarded with stuff that you might not necessarily want so just be diligent around going through the process and going through the process and when you've done that you'll just have an easier more plausible life relative to the brands that you want to engage with and and and, and interact with um in in terms of the the brand watch proposition 
really get to understand the behavior of your consumers relative to, well, first find data sets that you can use effectively because most marketers actually, as big as their data set may be, they, they don't necessarily know how to use the data sets and they don't really know how to extract key insights and value. And that's why you have the likes of the Nielsen's and the Cantars and, and, and brands like that on the back end trying to do that. But, but really use the data sets to understand the segmentation of the audience, the affiliation with your brand, how those brands are being consumed and what those other layers are so that you can look at seasonality, brand life cycle and, and the various parts of where your brand is more relevant on a Saturday, Sunday, Friday or a Monday and just start really getting into understanding that and then letting creative come to the fore and start driving value for brands as well, because it's not just about where you place your ad and how much money you spend. It is also about the efficacy of the creative, the simplicity of messaging, the straightforward clarity of, of the hook to lean in, and some really great call to actions as well. Um, so getting to understand the usefulness of, of those particular things and, and ensuring that you do see where the opportunities for brands of association are, because I think it's a totally underutilized proposition, particularly in South Africa. We've got such great brands. And even if you can start pairing some of the local and international brands to create these wonderful stories of collective support, um, you know, that's, that's, that's worth considering. Absolutely. Craig, thank you. Uh, that's so insightful. <laughs> and you've got my brain running yet. Yeah. <laughs> another conversation after this. I was like, pick your brain a bit. But um, yeah, so what are we doing in uh, next week? Um, Tell people uh, um, what we're going to be talking about uh, up next week, and also how can people get hold of you? Because you know, a, a lot of people want to say, you know, let's let's have a coffee, let's chat, and see, you know, what's the best to do that. So, so definitely, uh, my my mobile oh eight three four five three four two double three. My email cpagelee at gmail .com, and there's no hyphen. Although my name has a hyphen in it, the the email there's no hyphen. And then at cpl underscore ignite on on Twitter, definitely get get hold of me in those those three environments. And something that I'm I'm working to try and bed down in the next day or two is there's some really great industry experts in in South Africa who have been working on content for integrated comms and they've written all the course content but they've actually made it available freely on a particular portal okay so they they're giving back some of the best content to south africa for folk in the marketing industry and and i'd like to get um to the the team around the table with me when we have the conversation with you next week and we talk about what it is that marketers are needing to ensure their relevance and and what these courses do for upping the the quality of integrated marketing in south africa and how to continue your learning and just be be at the the forefront of of the game fantastic that's um looking forward to that too it's like <laughs> Uh, I love these conversations. Craig, thank you for your time. Thank you for, for the insights. Um, and I'm looking forward to next week. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm really two, two, two in the bag and uh, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying this. It, it is something is stretching me a bit again as well, because as I say, you know, every, every one of the conversations, I have to bring some value around substantiation and facts and things like that to, to the table. So it's helping me get back under the skin of the industry that, that I've, I've missed for a while. Thank uh -huh. you. Chat to you soon. Thanks, Craig. Thank you, Kevin.